I'm glad to say that James joins us now. James, welcome uh, to the mother of all. Good evening, shows. George. I'm going to tax you this evening because I need your take on all of the things that I've discussed in my opening monologue, starting with the Netherlands. There's something big happening on the European mainland, isn't there? There is, not that it's reported much on um, the legacy media. I mean, it's like the truckers, that wasn't really reported on either. But basically, society, in terms of supply chains, pretty much stops if the truckers and the farmers decide to stop it. Um, and there's, the truckers, it was all about, you know, the, the concerns about freedoms, they got into lockdowns and vaccine passports. But this one is to do with a lot of bad policy by governments, which has escalated, obviously, with the cost of living crisis. And it seems like they've got a lot of support in their own country, the, the farmers in the Netherlands. But there is a knock-on effect to this, George. The Netherlands is the second biggest exporting agricultural product country in the world. And that, therefore, what the farmers are doing is exerting their power. If they block the ports, the roads, there's not going to be much that gets out of the country, and that's going to have a massive knock-on effect to markets around the world who are getting their supply chains in terms of agricultural provision from the Netherlands. But it goes back to the point that we've discussed once before, George. The, polit the high-polluting politicians can do what they want and have their agendas. But without farmers, there's no food. Without truckers, there's no food. And the truckers and the farmers know that, and they can stop the country by coordinating blockades. It happened in Canada. And it's now happening in Netherlands, not just Netherlands as well. It's happening in Italy, it's happening in Germany. So the word is spreading. And it's another lesson for, by, in terms of the art of effective protest. If there's bad governments, effectively those bad policies catch up with the governments in the end because various communities take some action. And this is a perfect example. It's parallels to the truckers in Canada with the farmers in the Netherlands. But there is knock-on effects when it come down the tracks in terms of supply chains because of these blockades. You make the point about bad policies, uh, but they're, they all run out of the same stable, James, for me. They run out of the stable of, of uh, what purports to be green, uh, you know, COP26. Putin didn't even show up. The Chinese didn't show up. The Western leaders prostrated themselves in front of, uh, of the, uh, the young girl. Uh, and her acolytes, they were Dutch auctioning uh, over who was going to cut this and cut that, cut farming, cut uh, fossil uh, fuels, and so on. Uh, so part of the bad policies are all running out of that stable. They all followed uh, the Joe Biden line on taking effectively wartime sanctions against Russia, and they're all paying the price for it. You're right, uh, it's not just in the Netherlands, it's not just in Italy, or even just in Germany, it's in Poland. I talked earlier about the uprising in Albania. Oh, this is a pan, or soon will be, a pan-European uprising. The question is, where are the British? Well, probably complaining about the quality of tea. I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't know what the point is. What's, what's the tipping point, George, in the UK for um, galvanizing people power? We've got a cost of living crisis as well. I mean, the cost of living crisis for me is interlinked with a cost of lockdowns crisis, because if you're going to lock down society and therefore plants, manufacturing factories aren't going to be open for months and months and months, that's eventually going to have a day of reckoning in terms of supply chains. And this is effectively what we've got here now. You know, the cost of living crisis, obviously, it's like a number of other areas, such as commodities, and quantities of easing, and so on. But fundamentally, one of the roots of evil here is because the supply chains have clogged up. But what's going to happen here is when you're getting a, a cost of living crisis, that people are making a zero-sum game choice about putting food on the table or fuel in their car or heat in their homes, the fear over the COVID era is now being replaced by anger. We've gone through a two-year cycle where governments have told us to basically know our place, whether you agree with the policies or not, but it did stoke up a lot of fear. But what's happened now is we're on the other side to an extent of COVID, 
and we're left with the collateral damage of the supply chain crisis. And when people are not putting food on the table and are not being able to put fuel in their car as easily as they could before because of the prices, then people, rightly so, are going to get angry and they're going to ask a lot of questions about what their governments are actually doing. And considering the UK government, they, their solution seems to be increasing national insurance, or in Sunak's case, saying that basically we've got to keep high tax. We're facing a, almost a new model of what we went through after the financial crash in 2008, 2009, where we then had a decade of appalling austerity that ripped the hearts out of our public services. This one is ripping the hearts out of people's day-to-day -day existence because of the cost of living. And that is going to affect almost every single person in the country. It already is. The only people who seem to be immune from it are a few highfalutin billionaires, bad actor corporates, a few bad actor technocrats, and inept politicians. Well, of course, some of them, uh, maybe all of them, are in the cabinet, and some of them, maybe all of them, are running for prime minister. I've not had time to count the high net worth uh, of the like of uh, Zahawi and uh, Sunak in particular, two of the richest men ever to enter parliament, uh, but it would be very substantial. I mean, between the two of them, and uh, Rishi's wife uh, were talking many billions. And that's just at the dispatch box, at the, uh, at the starting post for this leadership election. Give me your reflections on the bringing down of Boris Johnson. Well, I think, you touched on it just before it came on. I am no fan of Boris Johnson. I think he's completely unfit for purpose, the Prime Minister. I think it's a stain and it's an embarrassment on this country, the fact that he went from, you know, someone with a bit of purple prose, if you're so way inclined for certain publications, to somehow end up as Prime Minister and via Foreign Secretary and London Mayor. But it is what it is. But I think that it's been calculated to get rid of him because what he was doing wasn't a great example. It was hypocritical. He tried to wriggle away from trouble, which had actually got him in more trouble. But... Our politicians all over the world have been hypocrites over, you know, various forms of hospitality during the COVID period. You know, we've seen it with Trudeau, we've seen it with Macron, we've seen it with Sturgeon, we've seen it with Starmer. But it was an opportunity to effectively pull up the drawbridge on, on Johnson. It did seem agenda-based, but I'm no fan of Johnson. But I'm also no fan of what might be coming down the tracks. You've got nine candidates there that have... It feels now, George, that politics has turned into a game show. What we've got now is basically a leadership contest of the Tory party that is like the, the worst ever series of The Apprentice. There's not a single candidate there that you think is fit for purpose to be prime minister. There's no gravitas. They've got no vision for the future. At least, maybe I'm showing my age here, but in the 80s and the 90s, you'd have politicians from different sides of the fence who were genuine public servants, whether you agreed with them or not. And they certainly had an intellectual rigour to get on top of the brief and understand what they're talking about and convey what they're talking about in a way that people will learn and respect whether they agreed with that individual or not. Now, we've just basically got show business politics, but with no depth on it. And I look at those nine, and I agree with you. I think Sunak is the kind of the chosen one. I think Morden probably will come in into the top two as well, possibly Jeremy Hunt. But God help us if it's a playoff between Sunak and Hunt. I mean, it's two cheeks of the same backside, to kind of quote your old phrase. But there's, there's nothing there. The cupboard is empty. And the people that I feel sorry for are all of us, because we're basically going to have another prime minister that's going to be there with the strings being pulled on that individual with no core vision to do the best and served by the thing that they're supposed to represent, us, the people. All they're doing is serving whoever's behind them and certainly serving their own interests. Boris Johnson won't go quietly from the scene, will he? I, I don't expect him to take a self-denying ordinance. I, I expect him to uh, sit like Edward Heath did after he was usurped by Margaret Thatcher and do anything he can to, uh, to cause problems for Rishi Sunak, should he be the next prime minister? I think possibly there's some stories emerging over the weekend that Johnson might actually stand in a leadership contest. <laughs> I mean, 
because there's a bit of buyer's remorse within the Tory party. And there's also, you know, there might be some remorse within the Tory party members because they don't like the fact that basically their darling, beloved, great Brexiteer Boris has basically been ousted. So there is rumours that Boris might actually put his name forward. So um, pass the popcorn on that one. But I, if, if that doesn't happen, I think what Johnson will do is uh, he will have his effects through, through the keyboard and the pen because I don't think he will be waiting too long to go back to the career that he had before, whether it's the Telegraph or Spectator doing forms of commentary. He's going to be sought after for that. And I think that's when he will um, he will try and seek his revenge. But we'll wait and see if the rumours are true or not about him putting himself forward for the, the leadership contest. Now, we're far too young to know uh, many members of the Conservative Party. There are about 150,000 of them. Their average age is in the 70s. Uh, uh, in fact, 72 to 84 aged, 72 to 84 is the mean of the people who will be making this decision. So it's hard for us to take a guess. But James, you and I are in the prediction business. What's your prediction for our next Prime Minister? Oh, I like the odd flutter, but I'm not very good at it. So take my prediction and, and do the opposite. I've got a hunch that I think, by fair means or foul, I think Sunak will get it in the end. The problem Sunak's got, though, is when it goes out to the members, because he's got no common touch. He's dull. I mean, Keir Starmer is exactly the same on the Labour side, and people, you know, people struggle even to know how to spell his first name, let alone understand what his vision is. I think Sunak might have the same problem, but it seems like he's the chosen one. So I think he will be in the two. Um, I think Morden hasn't made a very good start with a couple of gaffes. But I agree with what you said, actually, before I came on. She's the one. I'm no fan of hers, but I could see her having a wider appeal and reaching parts that the Tory party may not have reached in a while because she, she's got the common touch. So if the Tory party were trying to think long term and widen their appeal she's the obvious one um, sunak is just a machine politician jeremy hunt is a machine politician on steroids they're not the solution the only people who think that they're the solution yeah, yeah, yeah. are themselves desiccated the de desiccated calculating machines james melville thanks as always for joining us on the mother of all talk shows